Well, good morning, Wren. I'm Brett Mason, and uh, my wife, Angie, and our daughter, Sophie, have been tending here about three years. And isn't this awesome? Yeah. We had to be out of town the last few weeks, uh, out of state, actually. And it's just so good to be back with God's people. So don't take that for granted. It's an awesome, awesome thing. I'm going to read our scripture today. And our scripture comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 14 to 16. I got to admit, when Jeff first gave me this, his love for tacos, I thought he was trying to tell us that chorizo was biblical. <laughs> That's not chorizo. So, you know, it's actually, I had to look it up. It's pronounced Chorazin, kind of like Chorazins, but not really. So here you go. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. In you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you, hears me. The one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, I was hoping he would drop that chorizo joke. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> I'm Jeff. I'm one of the leaders here at the church. I uh, brought almost enough clothes to change after getting uh, baptizing some people today, so I may or not may not be wearing underwear. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like, oh, I that's the thing I forget. That's the thing. Jokes, jokes, <laughs> jokes. I'm just glad you're here. I believe uh, God is praised in our gathering and in our praising of him. Oftentimes we go through situations in life where it just doesn't feel like that's inside of us to give. And it's in those moments that we ask God to help us. We ask God to help us praise. It's easier to do it on days like today when people are being baptized, when they're having a public declaration of their faith in Jesus Christ, where God has changed them in such powerful ways they're no longer willing to hide in the shadows. Not that they were hiding in the shadows. But to just say, I'm going to declare my allegiance to Jesus publicly. I'm going to do so by being immersed in water. And there's a whole different study we can do all that. But just to say this, that God is being praised today. And he's being praised today. Oh, my goodness. Because he's worth it. He's worthy to be praised. And, and you might not be in that place where you just can't give it. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm glad you're here. Praise be to God for you. Ask him. Ask him to show you how to praise. Ask him to give your lips and the tongue the words to say. Get, ask him to lead you to a place where you could surrender your life and you could follow him as well. So I'm glad we're here. We're in uh, Luke chapter 10 again, and I want to just start with a little intro story here. So at 1245 a.m. on March 3rd, 1991, most of you weren't born in this room, I'm sure, but a man that, who was on parole for robbery, he stops his car after leading the police on a nearly eight-mile pursuit through the city streets of Los Angeles. The chase began when the driver, who was intoxicated, was caught speeding on the freeway by the California Highway Patrol, but he refused to pull over. And so the LAPD cruisers and a police helicopter joined the, suit, joined the pursuit. And when the driver finally stopped right by the Hanson Dam Park, several police cars descended upon this man's white Hyundai. A group of LAPD officers ordered the driver and the other two occupants of the car to exit the vehicle and to lie flat on the ground. Two of the passengers complied, but the man driving the car was a little slower to respond, getting on his hands and knees rather than lying flat. Four officers attempted to force the man down, but he resisted. And the officers stepped back and tased him with a charge of 50,000 volts. And when he still didn't respond to their demands to lie flat on the ground, they tased him a second time. It was at this moment that a resident in a nearby apartment complex took out his brand new video camera and began to record what took place next. And in the brief 89 second video records what happened. After being chased, tased rather twice, the driver of the vehicle got up and began to run. So one of the officers pulled out his baton and hit him on the side of the head and knocked him down. Other officers joined with him, trying to subdue the driver with their batons, and they struck him as many as 56 times. 
When the man finally laid down, he had sustained a broken leg, multiple facial fractures, and numerous bruises and contusions. And unaware that the arrest was being videotaped, the officers downplayed the level of violence used to arrest the driver. And so when they filed their official reports, they just claimed that the driver had suffered only cuts and bruises, quote, of a minor nature, unquote. So when the video was made public, there was an outcry from the community for sure, and actually eventually the whole country. And they thought that excessive force was being used by the police. And soon a national de debate began regarding police brutality. Four of the officers were ultimately indicted by a Los Angeles grand jury in connection with the beating. And they were charged with assault, with a deadly weapon, and excessive use of force by a police officer. And a trial commenced. 14 months later, a 12-person jury reached a verdict of not guilty on all accounts. These acquittals of these four officers touched off riots in the city of Los Angeles. And arson, and looting, and murder, and assaults in the city grew into the most destructive US civil dis disturbance of the 20th century. In three days of violence, more than 60 people were killed. More than 2,000 were injured, and nearly $1 billion in property was destroyed. On May 1st, the President of the United States finally ordered military troops and, and riot-trained federal officers to Los Angeles to quell the unrest. So many people felt that the driver of their car who had been beaten by the police deserved justice, and he never received it. In fact, years later, when O.J. Simpson was acquitted of murdering his wife and her ex-wife and her friend, some of the jurors in that trial admitted one of the reasons they voted Simpson not guilty of murder was to seek justice for Rodney King, the driver of the car who was beaten by police some two years before. Anybody remember these stories? Wow. For our generation, for a younger generation now, we might flash back to March of 2020, or spring of 2020, forgive me, um, when a, um, the death of a man named George Floyd hit the news as well. I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the, the, the person, that the, one of the reasons the riot started was because they were seeking justice. And there's something inside of us that, that bothers us when people seem to get away with something they should, be, should not get away with. Uh, why do we care about justice is the question I just want to put before you. Why, why is that something inside of us? Why does something rage inside of us when somebody seems to get away with something? More importantly, let me ask you this. Why do I have such joy when some idiot on the highway passes me going 100 miles an hour, weaving in and out of traffic, but when I see him five miles later, he's been pulled over by the police? And when I get in the left lane, I go a little beep, beep, point and say, I see you. <laughs> like, you get what you deserve. That's what we want. That fool got what was coming to him. And oftentimes when someone appears to get away with something, we take matters into our own hands. We become the Kins and the Karens who feel obligated to tell the neighborhood kids that they're riding their bikes too fast on the sidewalk or they can't fish in the private pond in our gated community. If you just read the signs, you'd know what's right and wrong. There are entire karmic subreddits with videos and stories of people getting their just desserts, getting what they deserve. There's a video of the irate uh, fast food customer who's yelling at the girl behind the counter because his french fries are cold. For $4, I paid $4 for these french fries and they're cold. And he's yelling at this young girl behind the counter and eventually uh, assaults her by throwing his drink in her face. And unbeknownst to him, there's a man behind him, another customer who sees what happens and comes up behind him and throws the man to the ground. And we go, yes, he deserved that. Justice served. You can spend hours on YouTube watching these videos of people acting as if they're the main character of every story and everyone else is just a supporting actor. These people break all social norms. They cause scenes regardless if it's in a public place or not. And the bigger scene they cause, the funnier it is to watch as they eat their humble pie. But again, why do we care? Why are we so bothered whether or not they follow the rules? Why does it, why does it matter to us if the people who break the rules would get caught? Ultimately, we have to ask ourselves this question, why do we care about justice? 
I uh, did not grow up in a Christian home. I've mentioned that many times before. Not, not anti-Christian. My family's wonderful. They're here in the room. Um, my dad's probably napping right now. I have no idea. That's a joke, Wayne. I see you. You're awake. I love you. If you want to know what my dad looks like, it's just like me. Just a little older. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and we're, again, not anti-Christian. I went to public schools, another wrong public schools, and I went to a state-funded college. I went to Illinois State University up in Bloomington. And oftentimes, I found that these schools would teach us mixed messages. For example, they, they always had several rules that you're supposed to follow. I learned early in middle school that if you don't dress for PE class, you can have detention. If you're late to science class again and again and again, you get detention. And the rules that the school established by the administrators were designed to teach us the difference between what is right and wrong. And to succeed in class, you needed to do right by the rules. That's what we've been taught. We teach our children the same thing. And the rules were established to ensure there'd be some sort of equity or equality among all the students. And it was the metric system used to determine whether or not you're doing it right or not. Are you following the rules? Yes, then you're doing it right. But the problem I had, and I didn't realize this till later in life, is that these same schools also taught Darwinian evolution. It just means this. It just means they believe that the highest ethic of, in this ideology is survival. It just means this, that the strongest and the fittest are afforded every opportunity to overcome others so long as it leads to their winning and surviving. In evolutionary theory, there is no right or wrong per se. You are doing it right if you're surviving. And you're doing it wrong if you die. The fit subject the unfit to their needs. The strong overtake the weak. The strong own the weak. That is the only rule of right and wrong. So the idea of caring about justice or doing right or wrong, it never really made sense to me as a non-Christian. Only till I became a Christian and started reading the Bible did it finally make sense. What is it inside of us that groans when justice is not served? Where did that come from? A couple reasons. One, when you start reading the Bible, you will learn on page one of the Bible that of all of God's creatures, of all of them that he created, humanity has been elevated to a status above all of them because the Bible tells us that we have been made in the image of God. So both men and women are made in God's image. Image. So before anyone can do anything to us, say anything to us, or anything, we must see that other people have equal footing in this life like you and like me. They have a value and a worth before they say or do anything. Secondly, we've been made in God's image, and we should expect that some of his character would reside inside of us, even if we don't notice it or understand it. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, there's a man named Moses. Some of you have heard of Moses. Raise your hand if you know who Moses is. Yay, go Moses. Moses was leading God's people at the time, and he brought them out of slavery and through the desert and leading them to the precipice of what is the promised land. The Bible has this strange language for the promises of God in this perfect, idea, idyllic, uh, idyllic rather location that he's leading his people. It's a land flowing with what? Milk and honey, whatever that is. It just sounds awesome, and God's leading his people there. And, and, and Moses is sort of, overcome with emotion and begins to sing a song. At least that's how he records it in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And he says these things about God, that all of his ways are justice. That just and upright is he. Because we are made in the image of God, we have his character inside of us. So we care about fairness. We care about justice simply because God does. But the Bible also tells us that that humans are told to rule and to reign and to have dominion on the earth that God created. And as his image bearers on the earth, we're to rule the land as if God himself was doing so with mercy and and justice. And this was going marvelously until you turn the page in the Bible and you see how the devil or the serpent or whatever we want to call him came into the Garden of Eden and tempted the first man and first woman, Adam and Eve, to disobey God. And in that moment, that, that moment of disobedience to God, it brought the ugliness of sin into the beauty of God's creation. Now sin had taken root into the hearts and, of men and women. There's something now competing 
for the innate nature of justice and mercy that's inside of us. Something else wants to drive the train, so to speak. Within a few pages, turn to page one more time in your Bible, we see that the destructive nature of sin had grown so terribly that we read of the first murder ever recorded in the history of the world when Cain murdered his brother Abel. So because of sin is what I'm leading to, humans could not rule with godly impartiality and justice. Those with the power to oppress did so with malice. And yet God did not leave them to blindly wander through this life. He gave them rules to follow. He gave them instruction. We call them laws. And they were intended to show these people that God still desperately loved. They were intended to show them what was right and what was wrong. And it was to strengthen their understanding of God's justice. It was intended to show them that there's a battle inside of you. One wants to go the correct way and one does not. It's the proverbial angel and devil on your shoulders. I don't know if you remember that from the old TV shows. Sometimes God's people were good and they obeyed all of God's laws. Yea, other times they were stubborn and self-centered and refused God's good instruction. Sin had taken them away from God's best intention. So for justice to rule and to reign once again on the earth, judgment would need to come. God would need to judge the devil and his ways of deceit, of lies and destruction. He would need to judge sin and the sinful people who sinned before him. And God would need to recreate his broken world once again and once and for all. And he's doing so through the work of his son, Jesus. Say amen. 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 See, we cannot have justice without judgment. That's why we writhe in anger when that person doesn't get into the right lane, knowing that Forsyth only has one lane now <laughs> by them all, and they think they can sneak in on the shoulder, and we're going to be okay with that. Guess who ain't okay with that? Pastor Jeff ain't okay with that. <laughs> but my wife constantly reminds me, hey, Pastor Jeff, you're a pastor of a church. You should not wave at them with your middle finger. I'm just telling you. Because they might be at your church next week. I don't know. We want justice. We want equity. We want fairness. We want all of these things. But justice or judgment has to come. God is going to have to judge. And he does through, through his son, Jesus. So last week, we read where Jesus had gathered 72 from the masses, disciples, if you will, and sent them out to the peop before the people to declare the good news that God's kingdom had come near to them. So if you go back to last week, we heard Ryan preaching about this, and Ryan talked about how sending them out two by two was God's way of helping them and encouraging them. When things got hard, another person's there to, to assist them. He showed the picture of a yoke. How many people were here last week talking about that? There's, a, there's another purpose that God sent them out two by two is we know that two people is the number of people you need to, in a court of law to testify, to be a witness to the truth. But oftentimes the Bible talks about you have to have another witness because if you say it happened, we don't know if it's true, but if two people say they saw it happen, it was true. So God sends these 72 people out into the towns before them as Jesus is making his way down to Jerusalem to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has come near. And God's people, the Israelite, the Jewish people, they've been anticipating this news for centuries. Expectation was on them. They have expected God to send a Messiah who's going to establish, establish rather God's kingdom of justice and mercy on the earth. And Luke, if you've been paying attention these last few months, Luke has made it abundantly clear to us that Jesus is that Messiah, the chosen one, the son of God, the one who will bring the kingdom of God to the earth. But for them to receive this message, they first must receive Jesus. And the same is true for us. The ministry up north in Galilee Jesus was performing miracles, signs, and wonders, and every one of these acts are attesting to the truth that he was God's chosen one. He healed the masses. He dismissed demons as if they're a small child trying to take their Twinkie from you, like, get away from me, kid. He just dismissed demons and healed people, raised people from the dead, and now he has turned his gaze to Jerusalem where he knows, knows now he will endure the pain of rejection and the weight of the world's sinfulness as it is carried on his back to the cross at Calvary, 
where he sacrifices his life. There he will die, he knows, but he will raise back to life. This is the way of salvation. This is the story that we must believe to be saved, to escape the judgment of God that is to come. I said earlier, as I spoke to the individuals getting baptized, that we, the Bible is clear, instructs us that it is appointed unto a man once to die, and then to face judgment. That we will live our lives here and we will stand before the holy God. And the question for us is, we, are we going to stand before him on the merits of our own lives? Or are we going to stand before him on the merits of Jesus in our lives? That's the question before us. So this story, the story of salvation through Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, is the story that the disciples have been instructed to tell. Tell them the kingdom of God has come. Tell them to look to me. And so the people go and they proclaim these things. And the story of Jesus is a believable story. Would you agree? Especially when you look to the human condition. God had declared that he would be the Israelites' God, the, the, his people. He loved them. He chose them. He says, I will be your God. You will be my people. A covenant contract, marriage contract, whatever you want to call it. He loves his people and he, he made an agreement with them. And God gave them simple rules to follow. And as long as they remained faithful to that agreement, everything would be fine. And when he said to them, I don't want you to worship other gods, and they did so, it was great. But every once in a while, they, they disobeyed God's commands. And they did worship other gods. And then they would falter. And they would break the agreement that God had with them. Because of this, they would do just judgment. And so God would reestablish them. And he says, if you come back, if you do this thing that we call repentance, if you return to me and follow me, then I'll accept you back. And continually God would do this. And we call this the cycle of apostasy in the Old Testament where they would follow after God and they would do everything that he commanded. Then they would change their mind about him and they'd fall away and they'd get, get into idolatry and all kinds of crazy things. And they'd, their life would turn upside down and turn hellish as if Sam was saying this morning, right? We make those decisions just terrible. And all of a sudden we repent and cry out to God and he's faithful and brings us back and we just start the cycle all over again. But God, in the middle of all of this, he has never once broke his end of the agreement. He's never once said, you've gone too far. This time, I'm not there for you when you need me. Never once has he nor will he do so. The, one, the ones who break the agreement is us. If this is ever going to change, then God is going to have to help us keep the agreement. And the, the person to do that is a man named Jesus, the perfect one to live the sinless life that you and I could not live. And not only was he perfect, and a man who lived a perfect life and could hold up our manly or earthly or, or hu humanly side of the agreement, but the Bible also tells us he was also God too. And so he held up the earthly, manly, humanly side of the agreement, but he held up God's side of the agreement as well. Jesus was that person. He has come to save the world, and he sends the 72 out to tell this story. God has come to save his people, and he's coming to save them from the coming judgment that is himself. Next week, we're going to read of the return of the 72. So put that in your calendar. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I don't know. I can't, I can't contain the excitement. What's happening? But today we hear the woeful words of Jesus spoken over those who just will not listen to the truth. Verse 13, chapter 10, it says, Woe to you. What do you call it? Chorazin? Uh, sounds good. Chor Chorazin, Chorazin, whatever. It's a city that doesn't exist anymore, so we, no one knows how to pronounce it. But he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works that had been done in, um, in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. They would be sitting in sackcloth and ashes. A bunch of stuff going on here. No, this uh, Chorazin was just a small village. Uh, location's uncertain. We don't know 100%, but it's possibly two or three miles north of Capernaum. We know that nothing truly special happened in, in uh, Chorazin or Bethsaida. We know that I think Andrew and Peter maybe came from Chor uh, Bethsaida. It doesn't matter. We, not, nothing special happened in these days, but we know one thing that did not happen is they did not accept Jesus. 
Think about that for your life. At the end of your days, we might stand over a casket or something and talk about all the wonderful things you did or didn't do. But ultimately, the question is asked, did they accept Jesus or not? That's the question that has to be answered. They did not accept Christ's demands, and so they received a horrible condemnation by Jesus. Woe to you. Tyre and Sidon are these Phoenician cities up on the Mediterranean, just north of Galilee. They're Gentiles. They're they're non-God people is what we're learning. And they're enemies of God. And and Jesus says these words, if all the miracles that I did in Chorazin and Bethsaida had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would believe. But you don't. And because of that, woe to you, Jesus says. Woe to you. To you, sackcloth and ashes just represented this issue of repentance. If God would perform the miracle in front of you and show you that he is there, you should, t- you should bend the knee and turn to him. They would do it if they saw him, but you don't. It's become so commonplace, possibly. I wonder if that's true in our lives. If God does such wonderful things in our lives, we sometimes forget that he's doing them. Like when things get really hard and we cry out to him and he shows up, we're like, oh, there he is. But when things are really good, he's showing up too. Like when your refrigerator's full, he's there. Not just when it's empty. He says it'll be more bearable, verse 14, and the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than it will be for you. He speaks of the judgment that is going to come one day. Reed Monaghan says this, even though this age is mingled with justice and evil, we trust and know that when all is said and done, the creator will judge the world with equity. The judgment will be altogether righteous and all the failures of justice in the courts of men will be set right for all eternity. It's just the true fact of his judgment that is to come. Monaghan continues that the biblical concept is that at the end of history, that Jesus Christ will return to glory on the earth, the dead will be raised, and they together with the living, they will be finally judged by Christ and assigned their eternal destiny, eternal destiny in heaven and or in hell. This great event awaits all of us. And it will be a visible event. It will be a public event and universal event. No one escapes this. And Christ's glory and his victory over sin and death and Satan, it will be fully manifest for all to see. Righteousness will be exalted. And the perplexing discrepancies of history will be wiped away and removed. And the mediatorial reign of Christ will reach its ultimate triumph. This is a great sentence, by the way. I didn't write this. This is awesome. And the mediatorial reign of Christ will reach its ultimate triumph as believers inherit the kingdom that God has prepared for them. Just like Moses, look over the water and see what God has provided for you. A land flowing with milk and honey, an eternity flowing with every provision you could possibly ever want. And God is just, and he would never demand from you that which you cannot provide. He even gives his son Jesus to provide the righteousness that you need to stand with him. For the record. In my mind, there was a much louder shout when I said all of it. <laughs> like, holy cow, that was preaching. I was preaching for a minute. I really thought, they're like, this church is going to get this. Are you getting this? Please, please. Are you getting this? Verse 15, it says, Capernaum, oh, and you, Capernaum, you think you're exalted to the heaven but you shall be brought down to Hades. Capernaum was the home base of Jesus. Holy cow. This is where Jesus ate burritos in the morning. I suspect, I don't know. Right, burritos for lunch, tacos, all the things. He did all the stuff that he loved. He did it in Capernaum, and he did it not for a weekend, but for two and one half years-ish. Jesus lived there, slept there, shopped there, bathed there, went to synagogue there, taught there, performed miracles there, and they didn't believe. They still would not accept him. Some people did, of course, because we have some crowds following Jesus through the desert, But most of them did not. And because of this, Jesus says, you are condemned. You're condemned. 
Verse 16, he says, the one who hears me, sorry, the one who hears you, speaking to the 72, the one who hears you, as you go and declare this message before the world, the one who hears you, they hear me, and the one who rejects you is the one who rejects me. And the one who rejects me, he says, rejects him who sent me, rejects God, the Father who sent Jesus. This message, ultimately, we must understand, though it be delivered by human agents, it has a divine source. This is God's message. If people receive it, they receive God himself. And if they refuse it, then they refuse God too. <laughs> Have you ever asked somebody um, if they think they're, go they're going to go to heaven when they die. Have you ever done that? Don't do that, just for the record. I, well, I don't care. You can't. It could be evangelistic. I don't know. I was at a, a three-day weekend Christian concert jamboree thing up in Rockford or Joliet, Illinois. I don't remember. Years ago, I was in my mid-20s. I went with one of my good friends, and we're watching Christian bands all day, sleeping in the tent with no showers for three days. It was gross, honestly. And um, on one of the evenings, my buddy Stumpy, it's his name, whatever, his Stumpy looks at me, and he goes, and he goes, Jeff, do you know what happened to you if you died? Like, do you, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And I just, like, I was so, like, Frustrated with the question, I just said, I don't want to talk about this. And I rolled over and just went to sleep. It really bothers people sometimes when you ask them this question. Sometimes they'll answer you. They say, well, I think God was going to look at my life and see that I've done some good things. And he'll probably look at the good things in my life and say that I'm a good person and God is going to accept me into heaven. But the truth is that any amount of sin or what we may say bad things in our lives, it condemns us as guilty before a holy God. We simply just cannot say, like guys, like, like logically, we cannot say that I've done more good than bad, so statistically, I'm a good person. Like, look at how this falls apart. Imagine if a person just committed a murder, like killed somebody, someone you love dearly, but they just came to you and says, but I don't murder all the time. <laughs> like most days, I'm not a murder in person. Most days, I do all kinds of other stuff not murder. And so I think we should just take all the other things in my life that I don't do, the non-murdering, and just call myself a non-murderer. We can't, does this make sense to you? No. If you murder a person, you're a murderer. If you've lied before, you're a liar. If you've stolen, you're a thief. And, and it doesn't matter if you recycle or give to the pet shelter or all the things that make you a good person, right? It doesn't matter you're condemned. The sin has condemned you, and God is going to judge that. This is a heavy message, by the way. Welcome to Renaissance. If you're coming, like, I'm shocked at how heavy this is. Thank you for visiting, by the way. <laughs> Preston, you should stay and hear this. I'm just saying. <laughs> Jess, pray for him. This is the idea that the Apostle James, the brother Jesus, describes in James chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, he says, whoever keeps the whole law but falls at one point has become guilty of all of it. And for he who said do not commit adultery also said don't commit murder. So if you don't commit adultery but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. It doesn't matter. You are guilty as charged. So all of us are guilty and deserve God's judgment. But there is hope. Ah, like this church is heavy. There's hope. There's hope. It's in Jesus Christ. It's the grace of God given to us. We can be saved from the judgment that is to come. The story of the Bible is an ark. It begins with God's perfect perfection. That's a redundant. God's perfection in the beginning of creation. Everything is ordered and operating exactly as God designed it until sin came into it through Adam and Eve's disobedience. And through sin came rebellion and destruction and death. Mankind chose to become like little g gods and decide what is right and wrong on their own. But left to our own devices, we ultimately destroy. We destroy others. We destroy our own lives. We act no different than the Darwinian evolutionists who say might is right. There's no room for justice in that world. There is no fair. You want to know what fair is? Get behind me. That's fair. I'm first. But God has ultimately chosen to undo the works of sin 
and he will restore the world to its Edenic state like it was before sin and death. And he does so through his son, and his name is Jesus. Amen. All that is left for us is to decide. To decide. To believe it, to follow the story, to pledge allegiance to him, to choose to serve him, to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and guide us and whatever, to publicly declare our, our you know, Christianity by being baptized. All that is left for us is just to decide to do this with him. And so I just want to pray for us. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and I'm going to ask if anybody wants to do to choose today, to decide. So we baptized people earlier today, just so you know, about 11 or 12 people went in. I didn't count them all. I did three myself, came upstairs. Um, if you want to choose to follow Jesus today, right, to make that choice, and you want to get baptized today, <laughs> I put my shirt in the dryer. I'm ready for round two. And I mean this seriously. If anyone would like to get baptized today, we would love to baptize you. I don't know how to do it. I didn't bring a shirt. It's all right. We got you. We're going to get you a shirt. I didn't bring shorts. I got so much clothes in my office. It's ridiculous. We will get you clothed if you want to be baptized today. So just find somebody with a shirt like this after. Am I wearing it? Yeah, okay. I thought maybe I didn't have a shirt on for a minute. I'm like, that is terrifying. If anyone would like to be baptized, they can be baptized today. We'd love to baptize you. Just follow Jesus, trust him with your life, accept salvation. So let's pray. God, as we reflect on this powerful message, we acknowledge all of our failings and the times that we have turned away from your mighty works. We are humbled by the depth of your love and the extent of your grace, which calls us back to a place of repentance and renewal. God, we pray for those, those hearts that have been hardened, like the cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida, and for all the work that, that you've done and yet they've yet to embrace. God, I pray that the truth would come in. If you're one of those people who just, his heart even now is just being opened to the work that God is doing, you can, just, you can just turn your life over to Jesus right now. I, I, I don't know if there's um, a possibility of me being able to see you. I don't know if we can turn the lights up a little bit, but with everyone's head are still bowed and everyone's eyes are closed, I don't know if you would just want to raise your hand to me. I'm looking to see if I can see if anyone wants to follow Jesus and accept the gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord.